Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Shelly, for starting us off. Uh, I am Rondo Gibson, Program Director of North Bay, um, and I'm excited today to be presenting. Um, this is our fourth uh, presentation this year for Train to Trainers, where we work to support um, our community members and our partners uh, so that they can go out and support the students who really need the support. Um, but once again, I'm Rondo Gibson, Program Director of Marin. We say thank you all for joining us. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kayla Edson, and I am the Program Manager for Central and Southern Marin, and I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, Liz. Thank you, Kayla. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being here. My name is Liz Perez, and I am the North Sonoma College um, Access Program Manager. Again, thank you so much for being here. Super excited. And we'll go ahead and move on to Nashelli. Again, hi, everyone. My name is Nashelli, and I am the program manager for Four Years Success and Alumni. I notice a lot of different school partners in our audience today. So as a quick review, 10,000 Degrees is currently supporting schools in seven different counties. And we work with students on college applications, financial aid, career support, and scholarships. Now let's jump into our goals for today. Our goals are to learn how to read and compare financial aid offer letters, learn some best practices for how to approach conversations with students and families in a strength-based student-centered approach, learn ways to reduce and adjust cost of attendance, and lastly, receive tools to decode financial aid offer letters. Okay, let's take a moment to first highlight and celebrate all the work that students have done to get to this point. From applying to college to getting admitted, this financial aid and college journey is a lengthy one. Uh, so now I will hand it off to Kayla to begin unpacking our unofficial offer letters. Thank you, Nashelli. Um, so as you uh, begin and having those conversations with your students, here are some frequently asked questions that may come up when you have the meeting with your students. What is a financial aid offer letter? A, the financial aid offer letter is a document that lists the cost of, of attendance to attend a given school. And it also shows any financial aid the school is offering to the student. When do students receive their unofficial offer letters? So for students who applied and um, got admitted to a four-year school, they're going to start receiving their unofficial offer letters after they are accepted. And for our community college students, they're going to receive their unofficial offer letter around May and June. Where can a student view their offer letter? And students can view their offer letter um, once they log into the school, school part, portal, there will be a section um, under financial aid. And then also there are times, sometimes letters are mailed as well. So just important, um, just for the reminder to let students know to make sure to check their portals or emails or ask their parent or guardian if they have received any mail. Are the offer letters final? Um, as I mentioned before, um, students will receive an unofficial offer letter um, shortly after being admitted. Um, and there are other factors that may slightly change a student's financial aid offer, such as verification, um, if they're missing a document, um, you know, final budgets. And um, a student's final offer letter is generally given in June and July. And is this letter the same every year? The student will receive a new offer letter every year and changes in income may impact financial aid offers in the future. Um, and what types of aid may the student see on their um, letter? And the first type of aid is gift aid, which is money awarded to the student that they do not need to uh, pay back. And some examples um, is the Pell Grant, the Cal Grant, and institutional scholarships. They're, they're the second type of aid um, is work, um, which money a student can earn through a campus job and they must work in order to receive the money. An example can be um, a job at the library or the bookstore. And um, the last type of aid is loans, which is borrowed money that 
does need to get paid back after graduating. And um, examples is subsidized and unsubsidized loans, parent plus loan and dream loan. And um, just know that to, uh, throughout today's presentation, you're going to be learning more about work study and the different types of loans. What are the listed expenses? Um, so the cost of attendance is the total cost of attending a college. This total amount includes additional related expenses that are not covered by tuition and fees. So in this example, uh, the total cost of attendance is 27,000. Um, but as you all can see, uh, there's um, multiple factors, you know, tuition, room and board, books and supplies, meal plans, technology, transportation, personal care, and social life. What is fixed direct cost? A fixed direct cost is non-negotiable and appears on the student's school billing system. Direct costs typically are charged in a specific deadline and an example is tuition. As I mentioned, tuition is something that you can't negotiate at all. Then there's flexible direct cost, which is a cost that can be reduced based on the student's preferences. And the direct costs typically are charged on a specific deadline. And an example, room and board, for example, if the students were to select a triple um, dorm, um, it can be less expensive versus if they were to select a single um, dorm and then the meal plans. And so the last one is flexible indirect costs, which can be reduced based on the student's preferences and needs. And since the school doesn't charge um, you for these costs, they don't appear on your bill and indirect costs typically come up throughout the year. And some examples can be transportation, personal care, um, social life, books and supplies, and technology. And a tip, students may be able to create a schedule payment plan directly with their college. And I'm going to pass it off to Liz. Okay, so now let's <laughs> see how it is exactly that we will be filling the need. Um, Keila just mentioned what the cost of attendance was for the school um, and how do we actually pay for that, right? So filling the need with financial aid will include paying with grants, work study scholarships and loans. Um, so when we have exactly how much it will cost per year for the student to attend that particular college, <clears throat> we would subtract what uh, was awarded on the student's financial aid award letter, such as the grants, the work study scholarship and loans, and uh, anything that is left over that still needs to be paid uh, for, it would be coming out of pocket from for the student and the family. So um, hopefully we'll get a sense of how to learn how to do that throughout this presentation. And we'll transition into what happens if the student has not received an award letter yet. Um, so some important items that would want the student to have double checked is definitely um, check that the student doesn't have any missing items and missing documents, any holds on their student portal. And sometimes it would be um, on a different portal such as the financial aid portal. So double checking if what portal the student would be having for financial aid purposes. Um, check their Web Grants for Students portal, CSAC portal, to make sure that there is nothing pending. This is where the student would be awarded a Cal Grant. Um, double check that the full legal name matches on the student's applications, such as um, the FAFSA or the California Dream Act. So the legal name is the same on the school documents as well as the FAFSA and California Dream Act and any forms that were submitted. <laughs> and um, yeah, check financial aid portals. So as I mentioned, sometimes they are different and um, they are not necessarily on the student portal. So double checking and making sure that if the student has a specific financial aid portal to go there to check. As well as calling um, the financial aid office to request a status of the offer um, if they have not received one, if there's something pending, um, if it's coming, um, just asking what it would be what what the status is um, is definitely needed. And uh, for students who submitted a California Dream Act, confirm that the AB 540 forms are submitted as well. And this will definitely speed up the process. 
Okay, and we're going to move into financial aid verification. So what exactly is financial aid verification? Um, this is when the school, the college, asks for additional documentation to verify any information that was submitted on to the FAFSA or the California Dream Act application. And how to know if the student is actually being verified. Um, if the student goes into their college portal, student portal, financial aid portal, and they check under to do, there will be documents on there that need to be um, either filled out on the system um, or print, printed and filled out and then submitted directly to, to the school. Um, what necessarily gets verified? Um, some items are the income that is reported. So income that's reported from the parents, income that's reported from the student, and what would be asked for that would be <laughs> something called a tax transcript um, or a the W-2 from, from, the, from the student or the parent. Household side is also something that gets verified. Um, for this, the student will receive a document on their to-dos. They will need to print it, fill it out, and submit it. Um, dependency status is also something that gets verified a lot. So Depending on what the dependency um, status for the student is, a form will probably be provided by the school in their student portal to need to fill out and also submit. California residency and questionnaire, um, this form will also be provided by the school to the student to print, fill out, and submit. Um, some best practices just around verification, so checking the portals often, um, definitely having Students check as often as they can. If they can every day, that would be awesome. If they forget, maybe um, having them at least do it once a week. So reminding them of just checking the portal and the importance of that, uh, because a lot of these documents are time sensitive and they will definitely delay their financial aid if they are not submitted in a timely manner. Um, they can definitely ask for an extension if needed, um, because some of these documents might take a little bit longer. And uh, what we had mentioned about the student portal, so where to check for these documents. Um, this is an example of what a student portal might look like. Um, there is a to-do list box on there. So that is where any verification documents would be indicated um, on the portal. The students can also check their financial aid offer letter and they can check um, admission status. So if they got into the campus, if they were waitlisted or um, did not. So again, if they can check this as often as possible, because like I mentioned, a lot of these documents are time sensitive and um, they will delay the process of financial aid, getting an, uh, a financial aid offer letter um, and yeah, getting the money that they need to be able to pay for their tuition and any other cost of attendance. Okay, and I also spoke about a tax transcript. So um, how is it that the student will be able to retrieve a tax transcript um, and what exactly a tax transcript is? So a uh, tax transcript is comes directly from the IRS and it is um, basically from the tax return that the parent or the student had done. Um, it's a document that shows the financial aid information for the requested year, and it's basically a summary of all that information that was on there. Um, and how to order a tax return transcript, this can be done online, mail, or phone. And um, something to keep in mind is that it does take a little while to, to get to the student. Um, so it can take seven to 10 days to arrive. So they wanna do this as soon as possible. Um, something that I recommend students is that if they can just go ahead and order one, even it has even if it, they have not been verified yet and might need it um, because it doesn't cost them anything to get it. So um, if they already have it on hand, they can make copies and submit it once it is requested. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Ms. Shelley. Thank you, Liz. So we understand that circumstances change. Some examples include new medical expenses, loss or change in employment. Any change in circumstance can be communicated to the school at any point in the year, uh, but the student does need to have a financial aid application on file to seek adjustments. 
If there is a change in circumstance, the student will need to submit a letter of appeal to their financial aid office. Okay, let's talk about negotiation. Uh, keep in mind that the first offered letter is just that, an offer. So after reviewing their offer, students can ask their financial aid office if there are any additional institutional aid. They can also ask for more work study and more subsidized loans. Um, again, the student needs to take the initiative to reach out to their financial aid office and adv advocate for themselves. Okay, let's talk about loans. Uh, so loans are a really good option if they're needed. We want students to make knowledgeable and well-informed well decisions when they're thinking about loans. It's important for them to know that they do not need to accept the whole loan to begin with. They can request more loans throughout the academic year. Uh, students should consider their long-term goals as well and how four years of loans can add up. So they should really think about their long-term goals and how uh, you know, getting these loans can, can impact those goals. Awesome. So to dive deeper into understanding loans, students should learn about the different types and consider it um, Consider the different types when trying to figure out what the best option for them are, is. Uh, one type of loan is subsidized loan. This loan does not accumulate interest while they are enrolled and students are expected to begin uh, repaying the loan six months after they graduate or if they drop to less than part-time. Another type of loan is unsubsidized loan. This loan does accumulate interest while students are enrolled um, and they are expected to be repaid six months after they graduate or if they drop to less than part-time. And there's also a parent plus loan. This loan is repaid once the loan itself is fully dispersed. Uh, keep in mind, you may request a deferment while a student is enrolled at least half time as well for, as, well as um, an additional six months after the student graduates, leaves school or drops below half time. Students can also access the FAFSA repayment simulator if they want to use a resource that may help them explore different options. So now I'm going to uh, talk um, about work study. Um, so some new to know uh, during the application process, student can express interest for work study on the FAFSA application. There will be a question that asks if the student is interested in work study. And then in this case, they can select yes. And if a student gets offered work study, they do not need to accept it. And if work study is not initially offered, uh, the student can talk with a financial aid office to request um, if they can be considered. So the benefits of work study, uh, it's flexible with school's holiday calendar. The, um, as a, the work study jobs are also flexible around the student's class schedule um, on campus. Um, therefore, the student will have access to the job without additional transportation needs. And some items to review is um, students need to work to receive the money. The student is responsible for finding an on-campus job. Sometimes these jobs can be competitive um, and a um, student can advocate to their employer for more work hours beyond their approved work study amount. And we do wanna share some takeaways um, as you begin the student-centered conversations. Um, so the first one is celebrate options. Um, so students will begin um, sharing out the schools that they've already you know, uh, applied to, they got accepted to, and we just want to make sure that we are supportive and aware of the student choices, the interest um, in other post-secondary education, such as technical training and certifications. Uh, we do want to make sure also uh, that student and family have an understanding of the uh, expected cost and common financial aid terms. Um, but overall, we do want to make sure that we do respect the student and family's decision. As you know, as educators, we already inform them of the different types of aid, and we review the award letter. 
and um, educator bias, we do want to be careful with opinions or using I would. Um, instead, let's say if they were to ask you a question, what do you recommend or what do you think would be a best fit for me to attend, we can use guiding questions. And um, by asking these questions, you can help the student figure out their choices. Um, and some examples of questions that you can ask the student is, what school will support you in achieving your career or academic goals? How do you plan to repay debt? So for example, if you do have to pay out of pocket, that will be a great question to ask them. Um, are there any organizations or features to these schools that will support you in your academic success, whether that is programs, volunteering, maybe they're interested in sports. And so uh, those guided questions will help the student um, and something to keep in mind is that, you know, our opinion may impact um, towards the decision that student makes. And we just want to make sure that the, once the student does select a school um, that they're going to commit to, they will be attending um, the school for the next couple of years. So overall, we just also um, want to make sure that we are aware of our facial expressions, any reactions um, we have, and also our body language. Um, now what we're going to get into is we're going to use a little bit of what we've learned today from our fabulous presenters. We're going to talk about what this visually looks like, uh, give you a couple comparisons on financial aid offer letters, award letters, um, and then we're going to go ahead and do some practice, some quick practice on what we've done in the past with our students by taking these numbers we see on these um, offer letters and placing them onto what we call a financial aid comparison tool. This tool will help us to figure out what students need or how much more financial aid they need for as like grant scholarships or have to come out of pocket or work or whatnot. But cool, let's jump right into it. I'm gonna, on the left side here, you'll notice that this is an offer letter from the University of San Francisco, which is right in our backyard here uh, close to Marin. And then we have uh, to the right, California State University, Sonoma. And what you're gonna notice is that these both look different. So I want to let you all know that no one financial aid offer letter is gonna look the same. Um, some are way more detailed than others. Some are categorized very easily to understand, and some will include the cost um, of attend uh, the cost of attendance. Which, if we look at the top section here on, on the right, you'll see that, as well as on the left, you'll see the cost of attendance. Um, and then we go down um, underneath. This is where we should see our grant and scholarships. If you're looking at California State University Sonoma, it'll be the second box. And on our left side, if you're looking at the sex, the second box down you will see that that is also where our grants and scholarships lie. Great thing is that these are very easy to read. Um, we keep going down, we'll notice that this is where they place the loans, um, how much they're offering, our students are, can qualify for a loan, um, as well as in our work study option. And the work study, like our presenter said earlier, can be adjusted if a student advocates for themselves and they need more money. So this is one area we, we do see and we have seen repeatedly over the years that can go up for students. Um, but they definitely have to advocate. Um, well, great, let's go ahead and um, get into uh, showing you another example on the next slide. And then you're gonna see an out of state um, financial aid offer letter from the University of Hawaii. Um, this is for a student that has an EFC of zero. Now, if we look on the left side um, for our need calculation, it's in cost of attendance first is $35,922 um, and that the family has uh, an estimated EFC of zero. So they are right away are telling us that our student has a zero EFC. So which means our students should qualify for all federal um, and state aid, but yet they're not gonna get any state aid because it's out of California. So we know that that's not gonna be on the, on the offer letter. So let's look down at the bottom to see what is being offered. And for this student, it, uh, we notice this Pell Grant, and uh, the federal direct sub subsidized and unsubsidized loan, as well as the Parent PLUS loan. So we see that this school is attempting to meet full need, but they're doing it more so with loans. Um, this is not the case with all schools, um, but we just wanna show you some differences and give you a variety so you can see how they're organized. Um, but this one is not the easiest to read um, as things are placed in different areas from top to bottom or left to right. All right. 
We have another example here. This is of a, one of our AB 540 examples for a student who would be um, attempting, or not attempting, but hopefully going to University of California in Santa Cruz. Um, and you notice that here we have um, just the award, we have the, the award amounts from grants and then underneath they place loans. Um, and then you'll see here, because the student is AB 540, that there's a non-resident exemption. Um, so which means that this is gonna increase the cost of attendance for the students. Um, and you'll notice with this blue circle that we're showing you is the non-resident exemption. Um, so our students will need to, if they're AB 540, will need to fill out an AB 540 affidavit. Um, maybe they forgot, didn't get it on time, or maybe the school just hasn't filed for the student yet. But if it's not filed in, um, for the student, they're going to have to figure out how to come up with an additional $29,754. Of course, our students are not required to pay this because they qualify under AB 540, meaning that they pay the same rate as students that were, are in-state um, residents of California. So quickly, we would work with our students to figure to remedy this situation by making sure that they fill out that affidavit. Um, you'll also notice um, on, some, on some, some applications, there is an option for uh, a, dream, a dreamer's loan, um, but a student would need to get a co-signer and there's some, some other forms. Um, we, don't, we do see the dreamer loan here. It is underneath university loan. Um, so I just wanna point that out that in the past, a few years ago, our students that were AB 540 could not um, apply for any loans to make their educational goals be a possibility for them. But now California state universities, as well as universities are offering this for students. So this is a big plus if it helps them to obtain their educational goals. Um, but we will know, notice that here, um, we do not have a student's EFC. Um, and without that EFC, we can't, so we can't, we won't know if a student qualifies for Cal Grant necessarily, but there's a way around that. If a student has a web grants for students account, they can check there to see if they qualify for Cal Grant. And if that student qualify for Cal Grant, we would then um, work with them to um, reach financial aid and to apply it. Typically a student, all students will not see Cal Grant on their first initial award letter um, because the state, um, the state universities will offer a state university grant and the UCs will offer the UC grants first and then over the summer in the second off letter that is when we should see the cal grants so i just want to point that out as well all right moving on great so just on the first slide i talked about that we would use a comparison tool later on um, so we are at that point um, so let's get started all right it's populated now we'll go ahead and move a few things all right, so first we're looking on the left, we have our uh, San Francisco State um, financial aid offer. And then on the right, we have our comparison tool. So what I like to do first is figuring out the student's cost of attendance. Um, and we're gonna do that in uh, column C, but, and let's go ahead and find that on the award letter from the left side. So our cost is at the bottom section, the bottom half and tuition, we're gonna go ahead and move that number of 7,006 over. This will be row four for those following. Um, and then we're gonna go ahead and um, also, since we want to compare if a student is living in um, different situations, we're gonna use the column D and column E to compare. So I um, just wanna show that, show you all that and point that out. So let's uh, go ahead and list over our tuition across, across the way. So we got 7,006 there, 7,006 here. And now we're just gonna go back over to um, a student living in a double, so it's like, two students in one room, in one dorm room. Um, our room and board, we're gonna look down to see what they suggest here from our uh, um, offer letter. And then we're gonna place that over. We're also noticing that they have books and supplies there. So we're gonna list that, that number down. Uh, and then we're gonna go down and see. Um, so now we're coming down to computer needs. So this is for every, this is gonna be different for every student. We don't know if every student's gonna need a computer, but for today's purposes, we're going to imagine that our student um, is going to need to spend $1,000 on, on computers and supplies. Um, moving on to transportation, we're gonna take this direct cost from um, our, our offer letter and we're gonna place that over. And then we have personal expenses. So this is where students, when we sit down with students, we ask them, what do you think you spend in a week 
um, on your personal expenses. And they are, they're always like, we don't know. I don't know. I say, well, let's think, let's talk about how many times you go to Starbucks or to the movies or you buy um, something each day. And then we help them to figure that out for the month. And then we go and we multiply that out by nine. And for today's purposes, we're going to imagine that our students' personal expenses is $2,058. Um, we're going to go ahead and skip right past our other um, miscellaneous costs because this is for typically we only fill this number in for students who have some other um, random costs such as like uh, eyewear or medical expenses that are more uh, that are more regular. But for today, our students doesn't have any regular occurring costs, so we're going to leave that zero. Um, let's move over um, to the right and let's add these numbers in so we can finish our our costs. And we're going to say our room and board for um, our adjusted um, will be here. Let's see. Place that over. We're going to say this is 13500 We're going to say our books and supplies are the same um, at 1038 And uh, then we're going to go down to our computer need and say um, same thing, $1,000. We're going to copy that. And then we're going to say that our transportation is the same as well. Um, because on this one, only our housing is changing, but our meals plan, our meal plan will stay the same. Our personal expenses will stay the same. Our transportation will stay the same. So for personal expenses, we're going to put down $2,058. And then we're, and now we can see already just between a double and an, a double room versus a, a room of a cheaper cost. Maybe there's four or more students. We already have close to a 3000, a little more than $3,000 difference um, that we save the students. So now let's go ahead and say that students living with a parent, and this is column E on our right side. Um, so we're gonna say that zero um, doesn't cost the student anything to live at home with mom and dad, other than they need to clean up after themselves, <laughs> follow the rules. And then we have our books and supplies. We're gonna list that at $1,038 as well. And mind you, of course, we know that some of our students are a little, little bit more diligent and we'll go out and find these books at cheaper cost. But for today's purposes, we're gonna imagine that they're gonna spend the same based off what the school says. Um, all right, our computer need is still gonna be $1,000 um, to keep that student engaged and working hard and performing. And then we're gonna look at uh, our transportation. We're gonna copy that number as well at 1,094. And then we have our personal expenses, living at home. Um, we're gonna just say that that is the same as well. Um, now let's take a look and compare the costs between um, the three, yeah. We're going to actually uh, adjust for books um, here on column, what is this, column D. So I wanna make sure you all know that um, our students, since it's adjusted one, I meant to adjust here. Um, this is a student who will find their books at a cheaper rate. Um, meaning they go to the library, find books, or they rent them, or they get them from Chegg.com, and they're using other sources. So let's go ahead and adjust this number downward to what some of, I've seen some of our students um, doing a pass at closer to $800. So this way we show you actually a little bit more of um, a difference between the cost. So now we're looking at a full cost. We're at $28,000 for the first uh, room option, uh, 146 And for our second room option, we're at $25,000. 458. And then for our third option, living at home, student came out of pocket $11,958. So it's a big difference between the three options. Um, and this is how we work it down with our students to get them to see that um, these can be affordable options for them when attending college. Um, but now let's go down to our second uh, box. And this is going to be our grants and scholarship, which um, we talked about earlier as being our gift aid. Um, and we're going to be able to see how much free aid free money, which does not need to be repaid, our student um, has received. I'm going to go down and do Pell Grant, and I can get this number from um, our left side uh, the top. And this student has qualified for the maximum aid. I want to point out, um, sometimes these offer letters will break them down by semester, but in this case, um, it has it for the full year. So full amount is 6348 Going to go ahead and place that in. Then we also uh, will place that across. And then we're going to go ahead and look at uh, what is this row 15? It says FSEOG. This stands for Federal Supplemental Educational Opportunities Grant. 
And this is a grant that not every student will qualify for. Typically, we ask that all guests, I mean, all students apply early, um, especially if they, um, they, we know that they have a, a zero EFC or they're going to be on the lower end of the EFC. Um, it's not guaranteed every year. Every college does not participate in this. And because there's no list of which schools are participating in the F SEOG, we like to tell our students start early and, um, and we support them. And then we also try to get them to apply more to our local um, or state universities because we pretty much all of these schools are offering the, the supplement educational grant. But in this case, we noticed that our student qualified, they were awarded this year, and that is at $400. So we're gonna go ahead and mark that across, which we have. And then we're gonna go down and look at non-resident exemption for AB 540. And our student in this case uh, does not have this. So we're gonna continue down and we should have, what do we have, grants? State uh, Cal Grant, and in this student's case, Cal Grant isn't listed because this is the first um, offer letter. So we're going to place and use the State University Grant. This is five thousand seven hundred forty-two, and then we're going to apply this across three options, and then we have uh, our institutional grants. Now here is where some schools will list out an additional grant for the, for the student if they, if they have funds to offer. In this case, uh, we don't have any to offer the student, so we're just going to continue down to other grants and scholarships, which they're not offering any on this, on this offer letter. So we're going to go down and look and see what our total is, and we're at so far 12490 across the board in free financial aid that does not have to be repaid. Uh, and then if you, one cool thing that we do, we do at this point, we look at row 19 to show um, the difference between the cost of attendance and how much we have in free aid to show what the additional need would have to be uh, or be covered. And we noticed that for a student living in a double, we need to come up with an additional 15,659. And this is if you're looking at row 22. Um, and then for students uh, who live who live in the adjusted option has a twelve thousand nine hundred seventy one dollar uh, difference that they need to come up with. And if we look at the student um, living at home, they actually have a negative five twenty nine. And what this negative five hundred twenty nine dollars means is that our student has a surplus. So this is money that essentially student can keep in their savings account for the for the next year or use it to maybe towards uh, studying abroad in their next year um, or pay for some additional supplies that may help them perform even better. Uh, but here's where we where we see the difference. Um, and let's go ahead and continue because we haven't gotten into work study yet. Um, so we're going to move down into uh, into the next work section and we're going to see how much we have for work study on this student so we can continue to cut their their cost. And the student has. Four thousand dollars here. Let's apply, apply that across. We have another four thousand. And let's compare that unmet need again. Now we can see in the first option, we're, we've got it down to 11,659. In our second option, we got it down to 8,971. So it's more paintable. And for our student who works and is gonna live at home can save the money they're working and they would have an additional 4,529 towards savings in the next year on their, on their education. Um, and then we don't stop there. We like to you know, sit down with families um, and make sure and check to see if they have any contributions that they've saved over the years, or maybe that they're, they know that there's some, some income coming in that they can put towards their students' education, and we ask them. Um, you know, and what we've seen in uh, some of our parents is that uh, oftentimes parents can contribute a little bit each year. So what we have to do is know what the total is. We help them break that down. And in today's numbers, we're going to assume that our student um, has zero, uh, zero family contribution at this point since we have a zero EFC. Uh, and then we're going to look at if the student has anything they may want to put in. And typically our students like to work over the summer and save all of those funds. And I've seen that our students save um, about $1,500. So let's go ahead and put $1,500 in for the student's contribution. Um, and then we will apply this across the board, $1,500. And then we get and we look at our uh, unmet need again, and we've noticed that this is even coming down again. 
to $10,159 an hour. If they lived in a double, if they want to live in a just like a, a, a four people in a room or more, they can come down to $7,471. And if for those staying at home, we have a larger surplus of $6,029. All right, and we still don't stop there because some students still really, really want to go to San Francisco so bad that they want to see what the loan options, how that would help. So let's look at Stafford, uh, the Stafford Direct subsidized loan and uh, how much the student was offered there. And we're gonna place this amount over on our comparison tool. All right. And now let's go ahead and look at the unsub. We're gonna transfer this number over to our comparison tool. And um, from experience, we know that each student will be offered up to about um, $5,500 um, if they have a zero, um, all students actually 5,500 in loan amounts that they could use towards um, their first year. Uh, so, but in this case, we have a Stafford unsubsidized loan amount of 929 that we placed in. Uh, and we're gonna go ahead and look down the bottom because we're not gonna put in a parent plus loan in this case, they were not offered it. So we're gonna just look and see what the unmet need has become now to see if it's, if it's feasible for a family. So we have a 5,730 um, and, and our first option in the student living a double and our Student living um, in the second option, we're at 3,042. And if we know the student that's living at home, if they were to take out the loans, which we would highly recommend that they not consider this, but they would have 10,458. Um, great. So this is how we use our comparison tool. Um, and sometimes we actually will do this option across from multiple schools and hope that families can make the best financial um, informed decision. Um, great. So I have a question. I see that yeah, students will students that have have um, been awarded Cal Grant will not see it on their first offer letter. They will see they will see especially if it's at a California state school. They will see the state university grant offered, and then they will see um, later on in the second offer they will see um, Cal Grant and state university grant. Okay, so we will be moving into scenarios. Um, we will be having breakout rooms um, with all of you. That will be about 12 minutes. So what we want to achieve in these breakout rooms, uh, first, there are four scenarios to choose from. The scenarios are in the chat now, so you will need to open that link um, to have the scenarios. Um, you will Two, you will take 10 seconds to introduce yourself. So just a quick introduction of your name, which school or organization you are part of. Number three, as a group, you will decide on what scenario uh, you wanna tackle. And number four, um, we'll need to have assigned roles. So um, someone that will be reading the scenario, a timekeeper and a reporter. Um, so as a group, go through the scenario that you selected and um, the questions that are listed below the scenario. We will be coming back and um, talking a little bit about each one. And we definitely want to hear all of you, what you have come up with um, based up upon your group uh, when we have come back. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are going to go ahead and tackle these scenarios now as a discussion. Um, so I will read each one of the scenarios and then um, any of the breakout rooms that decided on that scenario, um, if you can please share what you discussed during your breakout room, I would really appreciate that. And then we can all um, have a discussion together. Okay, so scenario one, um, it is spring and you are meeting with high school seniors to help them read over their financial aid award letters and assist them as they make a decision on where to attend college in the fall. This student is black from a low income background with two younger siblings. She will be the first in her family to attend college. She applied to 16 schools and was accepted into 10 including two UCs and several private colleges out of state. She has expressed a desire to attend a historically black college and mom is supportive. Her dream school is Spelman College and HBCU in Atlanta, and she got in. 
as the choices are laid out, it is clear that Spelman will require about $25,000 in loans each year. While the two UC schools are essentially free and the other colleges are somewhere in the middle, it is now late April and she needs to make a decision soon. Okay, so do we have anyone that would like to share and participate? Okay, I see a raised hand. Anisha, go ahead. Thank you. So hello, how is everybody? Hello, thank My you. My name for is Lanisha. I'm the UCSF Deputy Director for I'm the Deputy Director for the UCSF Trio Upperbound Program, housed at NEI Pi. And we chose, my group chose this scenario because I'm actually going through this right now. I had, I had a student, I have a student right now who her dream college is Spelman. <laughs> <laughs> and she is from a single parent household and all of this scenario fits her perfectly. So we were saying how Spelman is very expensive compared to the other ones. And our first thing will be to tell her, okay, look at the cost and we will do the money chart. Yes, the comparison tool. We'll do that with the scholar first. Once the scholar does that, then if they still wants, is still like deciding on Spellman or trying to have an indecisive spirit, then we will guide them, tell them about the best experiences and where they will fit best, where this college will support them best and their goals. But also, we will also take account and tell them about the experience at an HBCU, because the experience at an HBCU is totally different than experience at a PWI. And for a Black woman as myself, and you said the bias, I have a bias because I am a Black woman who went to PWIs. And instead of experiencing the HBCU while I was in college, I experienced it after college. And I understand that in experiencing after college, I wish, I wish that I had that experience in college because college would have been more fun and geared towards my heart. And I would have had a grand experience compared to college just being, let me just hurry up and get this done because I know I have to do it, if that makes sense. Yeah. So... I would, we will tell them about those experiences and let them understand our bias. However, we also will remind them of the cost because at the end of the day, you still got to pay that money. However, every college, you still gonna have to take out some kind of loan. If you want to be real, you're going to have to take out a loan. And in taking out the loan, I was like, I was telling them that I would tell the scholar, you know, at the end of this loan period, you got four months, four years and six months to start paying this loan back because you paid six months after they graduate. So I would tell the scholar, you know, you're going to have to help your mama pay this loan back. And then, you know, that tends to get them to thinking differently. So I would just bring out all the scenario, all the different avenues that each student can take. Well, we will just bring out the different avenues. And one of my colleagues said, the best, ex we'll look for the best experience and where will they fit? Where would the support be at? So yeah, that's us. Yeah, we also talked about this too, um, in this scenario in my group. And another thing that we suggested was to always remind the student that, you know, like if this is still the option for you, because you're gonna pay a cost. Like even at the UC, if it's free as a person of color, like you're gonna go through traumatic experiences. So it's not free in the end, your education isn't free. So 25K could be more worth it to go to a school where maybe it's the first time you have people that look like you and you are the majority on campus, especially coming from the Bay Area and California. That's not something we experience very much. Um, so just giving them other options, like last, you know, when you're like at Plan Z, 
um, just reminding them like you can always come back home and go to community college if this is something that you really truly can't afford in the end. Um, and then also reminding them like, like you had also said, like what kind of jobs are you interested in getting? Like what kind of careers or connections could you also get involved with? But that might help you pay for this school like once you get there um you know what other options like living off campus can you get in in-state tuition and then maybe it'll cut the cost a little bit so there's lots of different things that the student can do like if this is the top top school um and i don't think like the 25k should be the like limiting factor especially for an hbcu yeah yeah, and I wanted to add also, it helps when we're, at least for those of us that have student loans, share what that experience looks like for us after graduating, right? What that process is going to be like, more than just paying it, is navigating how to talk to your loan provider, what that looks like realistically, if you're able to, uh, you know, job wise and managing all of that because it is a whole different playing field when you find yourself in a situation in having to repay those loans. Um, not to discourage, but just to provide all of the information possible um, so that if they are considering that, that they feel more comfortable and okay, there are others that are going through this that I can talk to. Because when you're talking to loan providers, it's different from getting the experience of someone that has gone through it. Um, so also offering students that if the individual is comfortable with it, I'm very comfortable with that because I think a lot of students have expressed it's been useful um, for them. And, you know, once they find themselves in that repayment period, they're like, hey, can we talk? Um, and it's not as daunting as it, it would be if they were to navigate it on their own. Thank you all. Um, I'm going to allow... Becky to, to go ahead. I know we have to move on, but Becky, if you want to sure. share. Thank you. Yeah, just really quick. Um, <clears throat> we also, something that came to mind is just kind of putting that loan in like real terms um, of like, okay, what's, what's that monthly payment actually going to look like? How many years are we talking? Um, because I feel like $25,000 is just, it's so much, it's kind of hard to even like conceptualize what that would look like, or, you know, if it's 25 or if it's like, we've kind of said maybe a hundred thousand, if you're taking that out each year. Um, and so I know FAFSA, um, somewhere on the website, there's a really good like loan simulator tool where you can kind of play around with like, um, if I put, uh, you know, if I'm making the highest monthly payment, how quickly can I pay it off? If I'm making the lowest, how long would that take? That kind of thing. So um, that's definitely something I would want to go, you know, try out with that student so she can really visualize like what that's going to be like. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you all. You all touched on some great points that definitely informing the student and making sure that the student has all the information correct and allowing them and their family to, to make that decision because that's where they will be going, right, ultimately. Okay, we'll move into the next scenario. Thank you all for sharing. Um, okay, so scenario two, student applied to the California Dream Act and plans to attend a community college this fall. In May, a financial aid advisor from the community college reached out to the student and informed them they had to complete the AB 540 affidavit, but the student never completed the form. In mid-June, the student registered for their fall courses, and shortly after, they received an email letting them know that they had a balance of $5,000 they had to pay. The student immediately reaches out to financial aid advisor. The payment deadline is a month away and the student is unsure on how to pay for their courses. Anyone want to share if they decided to tackle scenario two? Can you just explain the AB 540? I thought it was um, for non-resident exemption, but mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so the AB 540 affidavit will be sent out to students that did complete the California Dream Act just to make sure that they are considered as in, um, residents of the state of California to be charged in state tuition. Yes. So that's why since this, in this case, the student did not um, complete the form, they are charging the student as an out of state 
um, which would be the $5,000. Um, I guess in this one, just some things to look at is making sure that um, we work with the student and checking their portal to make sure that they receive the AB 540 affidavit form, um, reaching out to that financial aid advisor like now and um, making seeing if they can get an extension and um, yeah, asking like how long once they submit that form, will their financial aid be updated are some um, items that we were looking at. Anyone else have anything to add? Um, typically students, I'm not, I, I can't remember if this is after their first year, but typically students can still register for classes, even though they owe money, they just can't register for the following semester. So um, if they can reach out to their financial aid advisor and see if they can get an extension or submit an appeal or something like that, figure out next steps, they can still potentially hopefully someone correct me if I'm wrong, but um, still register for classes. And then while that's being dealt with, they can still attend classes. Thank you, Jackie. Okay, we will thank you all for your input on this scenario. Uh, let's go ahead and move into scenario three. Uh, the student submitted a FAFSA application in October using their parents 2021 tax forms and their EFC was around $9,000. This means the student was not Pell eligible, Pell Grant eligible. However, in November, their parent lost their job due to COVID and their family income significantly decreased. The taxes used to file FAFSA are not accurate reflective of the student's current financial situation anymore. It is now March and the student has started receiving offer letters that assume um, she has an EFC expected family contribution of $9,000. The student shared their family's financial situation to, to you and you estimate that uh, with their family's changes in income, the student's new EFC most, would most likely make them Pell eligible, Pell Grant eligible now. Um, so this was kind of what we spoke about earlier about the, um, change in circumstance that might happen with students. Hector, go ahead. Yeah, so in our group, we talked about, so after completing the FAFSA application, what you wanna do is actually report uh, your unusual circumstance um, to the financial aid office uh, at your college. And in some cases, the financial aid office may decide to take the unusual circumstance into account and adjust either your cost of attendance or uh, recalculate uh, the information uh, for um, the EFC. And then that may make the, uh, and then you must also provide like uh, information, like inform documents of what your unusual circumstance is. So like, for example, if a family member, like a parent lost a job, you can provide that type of um, the documentation so they can recalculate the EFC. Awesome, thank you, Hector. Uh, Mark Estrada? Yeah, I agree with uh, Hector. Um, submitting like your individual circumstance form. And then I was in a situation too where I personally was out of school for like a few years. And then I wasn't able to be like on my parents' like taxes anymore because I like made a little more money. So I filed as independent. And then that's one thing I would suggest to other students uh, at the high school I'm at right now too. Because they don't plan to like be on their, like they don't plan to have their parents support them. So I suggest like going independent and then letting them know to like after they do their FAFSA with their parents' information that they're not gonna be um, supported by them too. So I'll submit that form to the financial aid later on. All right, thank you, Mark. Um, so definitely, yeah, communicating with the financial aid office um, as soon as possible. And um, in some cases, yeah, the financial aid office will reach out with additional documentation that needs to be filled out and turned into them in a timely manner. Lanisha, go ahead. I just wanna ask a question because I heard both of the guys and there's some good information. So I was just wondering when, because if a student decide to not be supported by their family and say it's like the middle of the semester, it's the second semester, we can send financial aid a 
a letter and tell them about the changes or who do I send this letter to? Yeah, great question. So um, the student would definitely have to advocate for themselves and reach out to the financial aid office um, and they will notify what the steps to take are. Um, so if it was already updated on the student's FAFSA or California Dream Act, then it needs to be updated there. Um, they might ask for supporting letters from anyone that they might have shared that information with at their school. Um, if it's a particular situation with houseless or homeless, um, making sure that the homeless houseless liaison for the district or the school is aware to support that. Um, so yeah, it, it will be particular to what the student situation is, but those are some of the steps that, that might come across. One thing that I'll add is that making sure everything's documented for the student. Um, if they have a case mat, in the case of like homelessness, like making sure that they have like a case manager who the school is able to be in contact with to like verify all those items, documenting everything and having that paper trail is key when students go through that appeal process to update what their financial situation is at their institution. Yeah, all right, well. Thank you everyone for sharing and discussing this scenario with us. Okay, we're gonna go into the last one, hopefully quickly because um, we don't have much time and we wanna get you ready for the rest of your day in a timely manner. Um, all right, so scenario four, the student submitted a California Dream Act application in October of their senior year. At that time, the student was in the process of becoming a resident, a legal permanent resident but had not officially received um, their green card. This, it is now May 15th and the student has committed to a college and they just received their green card in the mail. Their most recent offer letter is based on the student being AB 540 and a California Dream Act applicant. Right, did anyone go over this one, Luis? Hi, uh, my name is Luis Fernando. Uh, I'm a fellow with 10,000 degrees uh, for the SF region. Uh, I work currently at Downtown High School and at SF International High School. Uh, so my group talked about, uh, kind of just pretended as if this was actually happening like live, um, what we would do, um, because I know a lot of situations like that um, where you have to think quickly on your feet happen and you don't exactly have all the resources. Um, so what I what our group decided to first do is definitely gather up, make copies of everything that they have received, um, whether it's like the green card, uh, uh, rec receipt of the green card or like um, the offer letters. Um, and then uh, we decided to do a little bit of research and we found um, the from CSAC, from the California Student Aid Commission, the application conversion form. Uh, which is a form from provided from CSAC that uh, is to reprocess a student for a Cal grant uh, or a Chafee grant or any of those uh, type of grants uh, where we would convert their application from application one to application two uh, with a change in like citizenship or like receipt from like a green card. Um, and then once we have that application done and once we have all those um those copies of all the paperwork, we would submit an appeal to the uh, financial aid office to where that student is uh, attending. Um, and that's what we decided uh, would be the best protocol for this situation. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Luis Fernando. Um, yeah, so making sure that that form, which is the G55 form from CSAC um, is submitted, which would basically convert the information from the California Dream Act to the FAFSA. And um, looking at, yeah, if the if that was actually confirmed on the um, CSAC transfer was completed, um, making sure that um, confirming with the different college financial aid offices that they received the new FAFSA application um, and request an updated offer letter that now reflects what the student would receiving would be receiving in their Pell Grant um, is something. All right, Claudia. Yes, I have a question. 
Um, after the student submits the form the next year, would the student be applying for FAFSA instead of the DREAM Act application since the student now has um, a green card? Yes, that's a great question. Um, yes, moving forward each year, they would be applying to the FAFSA because they now have the green card, which they can um, include onto the FAFSA with the, the number that's listed on there that is required as well. Thank you. Any, yeah, no problem. Anyone else? All right, well, thank you everyone for discussing these different scenarios with, with us um, as well as in your breakout rooms and thank you for your participation. Moving on to um, next steps with Nashelli. Yeah, thank you, Liz. So on this slide, we have provided an overview of some next steps for students. On May 1st, high school seniors will accept their school's offer of admission and pay for their orientation, housing, and enrollment. Uh, likewise, on June 1st, community college transfer students will also accept their school's offer of admission and pay their orientation, housing, and enrollment fees. Uh, in June, July, students will review and accept their official offer letter. Uh, it's important that students write down financial aid disbursement dates and any payment deadlines. In August and September, students need to ensure that their tuition and other costs are paid before the school's deadline. And a quick note, orientation, housing, and enrollment fees are an out-of-pocket expense. Uh, however, students can request a waiver or reduction in fees through the admission office. Uh, so it's important for them to ask about, um, you know, the possibility of getting this like waiver reduction fee if they need it. And that's the end of today's uh, presentation with you all. Uh, we want to open it up to any questions. So feel free to either unmute yourself or type your questions in the chat box. Um, and then, so there is there any questions? Uh, we are definitely uh, mindful, being mindful of um, your day and time. Have a great rest of your day. We'll still be here. So if there's any questions, we can um, answer them. Oh, Ellen, you have a question. It's, sorry, I'm a scholarship provider and um, just thinking about these award letters, their kind of outside scholarships aren't really listed on there. So is it, I know that they have to report those scholarships to a financial aid office for them to be included. Is there a deadline for that? Is there a way for um, them to provide that information or take that information into account more when making these decisions. I know that our deadlines for when we get students um, answers about their scholarships kind of vary and we try and get it done in April so that they have that information before they have to make a selection for a college. But just uh, is there any way that we can help them <laughs> too to have the information they need to make a better decision? I can go ahead and jump in on that one. Um, I think the best practice is to always, when the student is accepting their award offer, the rule of thumb is always to encourage them to notify um, the institution at that point of any aid that they have available. Um, as a scholarship provider, if you are sending those funds directly to the school, the institution will automatically factor that in into their award that are already and they'll see that be populated onto there um, and outside of that if the student is receiving that aid directly um, the best practice is always to encourage them um, as a reminder when they're accepting their award letter in the summer to um, notify the schools at that point um, there isn't a specific deadline um, it very much varies by the institution um, but usually once they're accepting that award offer, that's usually the best practice that we always encourage students um, as a reminder to submit that to the institution. Just know that we don't send them their, the check to the school until usually July or August. So it just seems way after the fact, you know, it seems very late to um, be factoring that in if, they've, if they received mm -hmm. their award 
offers so much, you know, in March, April, May, June, et cetera. Caitlin? I, yeah, I have a question also. So um, obviously we're encouraging our students to fill out like FAFSA and DREAMAX on time and early, but every now and then um, there's a student who maybe wasn't meeting regularly with a counselor who applied to transfer and has not yet um, filled out FAFSA or DREAMAX. And so I'm familiar with how that process looks like at the community college, but I was just curious, like any like trends, I'm sure it varies by school, but for UCs and CSUs, if there's a student that did not file by March 2nd, how does that usually impact their award letter? Is there like an answer generally speaking to that or does it just, I mean, obviously they'll reach out to financial aid ASAP at that school to, um, to ask, but I'm just curious if you've noticed anything with award letters, if they still qualify for like state university grant and full Pell grant or how that works. Yeah, um, excuse me. And Carla, feel free to jump in as I was just messaging Carla that um, I'm going to ask her how what she's seen. Um, from my experience, um, students who are applying, who apply late, but um, or like, what do you say, have a, a very low EFC or a zero EFC, still have received their maximum Pell Grant, as well as the maximum California Cal Grant, um, as long as they were eligible and they did it within, um, typically in my experience, is students who've done it within like a month of being late. Um, now, anything outside of that, I have no experience with, um, but from what I've, what I've been trained on and from all the conferences we've been at and, and all the individuals we spoke to, some of these students that they wait too long after the priority deadline, they will still get their Pell Grant, but they lose out on, on the state aid. Um, and that aid within turns into what is called the entitlement grant, and that becomes a lower amount for students who may have received um, Cal Grant A um, and want to go to a private school at nine thousand dollars, and that, that amount will be lower if it's if it's um, an entitlement grant. And for students that are going to get Cal Grant B at it for a state school, um, if they're in their second or third year, that would pay for their full tuition. But if they get the entitlement grant, it's going to be lower. So they'll still get some funds, but it's not going to be the maximum amount. Um, so yes, students can still and should still apply, and every financial aid office will advise and encourage families to apply regardless of how late it is. Um, and as well as we shared earlier, you can actually make corrections to your FAFSA throughout that first school year anyway. So because family situations change, people lose jobs, COVID has happened, um, you know, there's a pandemic, there's also all kinds of things that happen. So you can always negotiate these packages. I wanna make sure everybody knows that. And yes, students should still apply for late. They still will receive maximum Pell Grant as a guaranteed source of funding for those students who who uh, qualify, but it's the Cal Grant that changes, as well as any state, or not state, sorry, institutional scholarships, then the, the students are gonna miss out on those because um, those have already been awarded and they're awarded based off of a, a calendar um, timeline because each school only can award X amount of dollars each semester, so, or each year. Um, hope that answers. If not, Carla, go ahead and add in some more, please. I mean, agreed to everything that you said. And just as a reminder, March 2nd is the priority deadline for CADA and FAFSA. Um, they do still have the regular deadline of June 30th, but just like Rondon said, like they will prioritize those students who met the priority deadline. And then from there, that's when that timestamp of their submission comes into play. Um, I've had students who have even missed that June 30th deadline and it's August and we're figuring items out. And so I think the rule of practice is always like be having the students advocating and communicating with the institution, submit the application as quickly as possible um, to get a, the quickest timestamp um, available. And then working with the financial aid officer to see what kind of aid they still have available um, and seeing alternatives for the students as well, whether it's that they're part-time, um, talking to their support systems of what kind of aid there is to support them um, into being even enrolled for a couple courses or um, for that half um, period for that first year and then working with them uh, that following year of once the applications open up in October to make sure that they meet that deadline. Um, but it's all um, first come first serve with that time step that they receive on that application at the end of the day. Thank you. Also, we do want to be mindful of everyone's time um, and have a wonderful day, everyone.